Well, as I told you this morning, we're going to be looking at the resurrection account from John's Gospel, chapter 20, and we're going to be uh, looking at verses 1 through 29. John, chapter 20, verses 1 through 29. Uh, This is really one whole account of our Lord's being raised from the dead, the empty tomb, the appearances of Christ, His, His coming to His disciples and uh, revealing Himself to them, giving them the commission, breathing on them, as it were, uh, the, Holy, you know, the, the Holy Spirit to give them strength. Uh, all of these things are really a part of the evidences of the resurrection, so I wanted to deal with them all at, um, at one time. So let me go ahead and read for you the, uh, the text, and um, as, as I do, I just let's again remember the things we've already seen about why it's so important that Jesus be alive that He be raised from the dead. If, if, if He couldn't save Himself from death, He certainly can't save us from death. If He's dead, then we're all dead, okay? We're, we're, that's all we have to look forward to, but He isn't dead. He is alive. John chapter 20, beginning in, in verse 1, now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came early to the tomb while it was still dark and saw the stone already taken away from the tomb. So she ran and came to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved and said to them, they have taken away the Lord out of the tomb and we do not know where they have laid him. So Peter and the other disciple went forth and they were going to the tomb. The two were running together and the other disciple ran ahead faster than Peter and came to the tomb first and stooping and looking in, he saw the linen wrappings lying there but he did not go in. And so Simon Peter also came following him and entered the tomb, and he saw the linen wrappings lying there, and the face cloth with which which had been on his head, not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. So the other disciple who had first come to the tomb then also entered, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the Scripture, that he must rise again from the dead, So the disciples went away again to their own homes. But Mary was standing outside the tomb weeping. And so as she wept, she stooped and looked into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white sitting, one at the head and one at the feet where the body of Jesus had been lying. And they said to her, woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, because they have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. When she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there and did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, stop clinging to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father, but go to my brethren and say to them, I ascend to my Father and your Father, and my God and your God. Mary Magdalene came announcing to the disciples, I have seen the Lord, and that he had said these things to her. So when it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and when the doors were shut where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in their midst and said to them, peace be with you. And when he had said this, he showed them both his hands and his side. The disciples then rejoiced when they saw the Lord. So Jesus said to them again, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, their sins have been forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, their sins have been retained. But Thomas, one of the twelve called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples were saying to him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see in his hands the imprint of the nails and put my finger into the place of the nails and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. After eight days, his disciples were again inside and Thomas with them. Jesus came, the doors having been shut, and stood in their midst and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Reach here with your finger 
and see my hands. And reach here your hand and put it into my side. And do not be unbelieving, but believing. Thomas answered and said to him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Because you have seen me, have you believed? Blessed are they who did not see and yet believed. May the Lord bless his word again to our hearing this morning. Now, as, um, as you know, over the last several weeks, we've been looking at what it is that Jesus has been willing to go through for us so that we might be reconciled to God, so that we, as we've already been reminded, who deserve nothing other than to suffer in hell forever for our rebellion against God, might be forgiven, might be adopted into God's family might be the heirs of His kingdom, uh, purely by His grace. Now, what is it that Jesus did for us? Well, again, remember, everything He went through, everything He suffered, He did willingly for us. He gave Himself for us. He allowed Himself to be arrested, to be put on trial by His own people, to be ridiculed by them, rejected by them, abused by them, to be handed over to the Romans by them, to be scourged and to be mocked and to be crucified, to be nailed to a cross. He was willing not only symbolically to be considered a curse for us, because the Bible says, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree, but to really become cursed for us when our sins were laid upon Him, when He became guilty and suffered in our place. And let's remember that what He suffered was not just the pain of the scourging, or the beatings, or the crucifixion, which would have been bad enough by themselves. But what he suffered was the wrath of his Father for the sins that we had committed. And then finally, when he had suffered enough, Jesus bowed his head, and he willingly gave up his life for us so that our lives might be spared. Now again, these things he did willingly. He could have prevented the arrest that really led to this chain of events. He could have walked away like he did on one of their occasions when they wanted to throw him over the cliff. He simply just walked to the midst of them and went away. He could have called down 12 legions of angels, one of which you know was enough to destroy, I think, 186,000 Assyrians, 12 legions of angels to come to his rescue. But he didn't do that. He submitted to this mistreatment, to this abuse, to this death, because it was the only way that He could save us. And we need to recognize that even on the cross, Jesus could have held on to His life, perhaps for a little while longer, but He didn't even do that. He willingly surrendered His life for us. He bowed and gave up His soul for us. When the soldiers came to break His legs so that He wouldn't be hanging, on the cross on the Sabbath, because it was a high Sabbath, they found that he was already dead. And to make sure that he was, one of the soldiers thrust his spear through his side all the way into his heart to make sure that he was dead. Well, the fact is, Jesus didn't hold on to his life, but he willingly laid it down for us. And then finally, we saw that he was buried for us. Joseph came, remember, and he asked Pilate for his body, and with Nicodemus, they prepared him for burial. And because the Sabbath was near, they laid him in the tomb that Joseph had prepared for himself in order to fulfill Isaiah 53, verse 9. His grave was assigned with wicked men, yet he was with a rich man in his death because he had done no violence, nor was there any deceit in his mouth. The prince of life was now under the power of death, a death he submitted to, a death that he did not deserve. It was the death that we deserved so that he might set us free from death once and for all. Now, this morning we're reminded that his death was not the end. Jesus did not remain in the tomb. But on the third day, his his spirit, his human soul, returned again to his body, and he rose again to life. 
Now, I've already mentioned to you the resurrection is important, and it's important for several reasons, and I'm sure this is not an exhaustive list. But first of all, it proves that Jesus is who He said He is. It proves that He is the Son of God. It proves that He is the Messiah. It proves that He is the one that the Father has appointed to save us and to give us life. And the way we know that is because He told us He was going to be raised again from the dead, and only God can tell us what's going to happen in the future because He's the one who has planned it. Only God can raise Himself from the dead, and that's what Jesus did. Remember, He said, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up again. You know, the the resurrection is actually attributed to each of the three persons of the Trinity, but Jesus is certainly involved, and only God can raise the dead. And God doesn't raise to life again liars, does He? So if the Father raised Jesus, if the Spirit raised Jesus, if Jesus has the ability to raise Himself, He is who He said He was, which is exactly what Paul said in Romans chapter 1, that He was declared the Son of God with power by the resurrection. Well, the resurrection secondly proves that Jesus actually accomplished what He said He set out to accomplish, which is to carry away our sins. Remember, it was our sins that nailed Him to the cross. It was our sins that demanded death. It was our sins that put Him in the grave. The resurrection proves that Jesus really did pay for our sins because if He hadn't paid for them, He'd still be in the grave. But once they were atoned for, once they were paid for, death could no longer hold Him. The resurrection is God's declaration that Jesus paid for our sins in full. Jesus is alive, our sins are forgiven. Now, as we read in 1 Corinthians 15, thirdly, Jesus' resurrection also proves that we are forgiven. If Jesus hadn't risen, that would mean that our sins that put Him in the grave had not been paid for, and we would still have to pay for those sins. We would still be faced with hell. But the fact that He has risen from the dead means that our sins have been dealt with. Our sins have been discharged. They have been paid for and atoned for. And because they are, if we have trusted the Lord Jesus Christ, we are free from the guilt and condemnation of our sins. And we will see heaven. And then finally, because Jesus has risen, we also will rise again from the dead. We do need to remember that everything that Jesus did, He did vicariously. He did in our place. He did for us. His obedience was for us. His death was for us. His resurrection is also for us. So everything He went through, He went through for us. And because His body was raised, ours will also be raised one day on that final day when we stand before the Lord for that final judgment. And by the way, the fact of the resurrection means that when we stand before the Lord on that day, we will be acquitted of all of our sins and we will be received into God's kingdom because of what Jesus has done. The resurrection proves that we have the hope of a complete redemption of our souls and of our bodies and that we will ultimately enter into heaven. So the resurrection is important, and what I want us to look at this morning is the fact of the resurrection. Jesus is alive. I want us to see really four things from our text. First of all, I want us to see the witnesses to the empty tomb. Secondly, the witnesses to the resurrected Christ, that He is alive. Third, the commission to share the message of the resurrection with others, and then fourthly, the power to proclaim the resurrection. Where does it come from? So how do we know that Jesus really is alive? How do we know that He was raised from the dead? How do we know that He conquered death, not only personally for Himself, but also for us? Well, we know it because the tomb is empty. Now, first of all, we see the witnesses to the empty tomb. And by the way, the empty tomb was not enough, as we see. They also had to see Jesus, and He does appear for that very purpose. Now, the first of these witnesses was Mary Magdalene. She was the first to go to the tomb early in the morning following 
the Sabbath. And by the way, as you look at these time frames and you see some confusion of evening and morning and so forth, it's been pointed out by commentators that John appears to be using the Roman timekeeping rather than the Jewish timekeeping. And I think that is important, you know, why it is that she comes when she comes, why it is when it's evening on the first day of the week. Uh, it's still the first day of the week in the evening. That's not the Jewish reckoning. So let's just bear in mind that we're talking here about Roman time. Well, anyway, she comes early on the first day of the week. And when she comes, she finds the stone has already been rolled away and that the tomb is empty. Now, the question is, why did she come to the tomb? What was she expecting to see? Was she expecting to see a tomb that was empty? Was she there to prove that Jesus had risen from the dead? Well, no. As a matter of fact, it's clear from what, uh, from what she says next that she expected to find the body of Jesus still in the tomb. We read in verse 2 that she not only saw, of course, the stone rolled away, she also looked into the tomb. But in verse 2, we read this, so she ran. And came to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved and said to them, They have taken away the tomb, or the Lord, out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. And the we there is referring to the other ladies who were with her, though John doesn't actually mention them. The other gospels tell us there were others with him, with her. She thought when she saw the empty tomb that somebody had taken away the body, whether friends or enemies, she didn't really know. So she hadn't gone to the tomb because she thought Jesus had risen from the dead. She went to the tomb for some other reason. And I believe that reason was because obviously she loved him. She was grieving over his death. And also from the other gospels, we read that she wanted to do something more for him, even in his death. They had brought spices to anoint the body of Jesus. So she went there out of love, but she didn't go there because she thought Jesus had risen from the dead. Now, when Peter and John heard, heard what she said, they didn't know what to, to make of it either, and they weren't sure whether or not to believe her. So they quickly ran to the tomb. We see that John was speedier. He's the one who's writing this gospel, and he happens to point out that he was faster than Peter, and he got there first. Maybe he was younger. Maybe he was faster. Maybe he had been exercising. I don't know, but he was, he was quicker. But notice when he got there, he only stood at the entrance, and he looked in. He didn't go in. But when Peter arrived, you know, Peter with his boldness, his, you know, he's just more of an of a, uh, upfront kind of a person. He went right in, and he saw the linen wrappings, and he saw the face cloth rolled up and laid neatly aside. Now, we don't know what condition the wrappings were in. We don't know if it was unwrapped. We don't know if it was still basically a cocoon that basically, you know, the body of Jesus somehow had just kind of passed through and left there. But the fact that the face cloth was neatly rolled and laid aside does tell us at least one thing, and that is that Jesus didn't rise suddenly and quickly exit the tomb, but he got up and basically took his face cloth and he neatly rolled it up and laid it aside in a very calm and deliberate way. Now finally, John enters into the tomb and he, and he sees what Peter saw. And when he saw it, he believed. But, but what is it that John actually believed? Well, it wasn't that Jesus had risen from the dead, but he believed that Mary had told the truth that the tomb was actually empty. Now we know this because of verse 9. For as yet they, that is Peter and John, did not understand the Scripture that he must rise again from the dead. They still didn't know what to make of this. Even though Jesus had told them that he was going to be killed and that he was going to be buried and that on the third day he was going to rise again from the dead, they still didn't seem to understand what it was that Jesus was saying. But now, after they were sure that what Mary said was true, they left the tomb and they went back to their, to their homes. But Mary had followed them. And after they had gone, she stood outside the tomb weeping. And as she cried, she stooped and she looked in and saw two angels dressed in white, sitting at the head and at the feet of where Jesus had been laying. And in verse 13, we read this. And they said to her, woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, because they have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. 
Now, notice again, Mary still did not believe that Jesus had risen, but that one person or a group of people had taken his body away, and she didn't know who it was or where they had taken him. Now, again, we have Mary, we have the other women who were with her, we have Peter and John who didn't believe this. And I believe in the other gospel accounts when Mary came and told them what had happened, it wasn't just Peter and John, but the disciples as a whole did not believe that Jesus had risen from the dead. Now, why? And we, we, need, to be, we need to be careful here because I think our tendency is on, on this side of the resurrection, having you know, the, the Scriptures in front of us, knowing that what they say is true, we can criticize them for their lack of faith. They should have listened to what Jesus said. They should have done what He said. They should have believed what He said. They should have been expecting this. Mary should have gone to the tomb expecting it to be empty. And so should Peter and John. They shouldn't have all been surprised. And yet, how many times have we experienced the same thing in our own lives? How many times does the Lord have to show us something in His Word before we understand? I mean, Jesus was actually preparing His disciples for three and a half years that He was going to die, and yet when it finally happened, they were still surprised. He was telling them that He was going to be raised again from the dead, but when it finally happened after three and a half years, they still weren't expecting it. I mean, how many times does the Lord have to teach us the same lessons over and over again only to have to teach us one more time? How many times do we doubt what the Lord says? Well, this is one of our greatest weaknesses as it was theirs, a weakness that we're likely going to have to face until we go home to be with the Lord in heaven. But one of the things that the Lord wants to teach us and is trying to teach us is to take His Word at face value, to believe what He says, and then to act upon that belief. The reason why Jesus told them that He was going to be raised again from the dead was to encourage them and to give them strength so that when it happened, they would be ready for it and that they would be able to do what He had called them to do and not despair, not be afraid. But they didn't listen, and they didn't believe, and they were afraid, and they were despairing if they had only listened, if they had only believed. Well, if we would only listen, you see, if we would only believe and take God at His word, if we would only walk in His will and do His will, knowing that God is going to be with us and is going to fulfill His promises, how we wouldn't have to be discouraged, how we wouldn't have to be afraid that things aren't going to turn out well because the Lord tells us they are. So we need to be encouraged by this to study the Word of God, to, to pay attention to what it says, to believe what it says, to apply what He says, and to move forward in our service to the Lord because what He says is true. And it is going to take place, even though the disciples didn't understand, even though they didn't believe, it still turned out exactly the way Jesus said it would. And when God speaks, you know that He's going to do exactly what He says. Well, we know there is more than just witnesses to the empty tomb. Secondly, we see the witnesses to the resurrected Christ, and this is the most important part. Now, though it isn't mentioned here, in the other Gospels, we see that these two angels who were present told Mary something else besides, or besides asking her the question, whom are you seeking? They told her that she shouldn't be looking for one who is alive among the dead. Jesus has risen, just as He said. So here are our first two witnesses to the resurrection. Our Lord tells us out of the, in Matthew 18, verse 16, by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every fact may be confirmed. Our Lord, first of all, put two witnesses there, and you really couldn't ask for two more trustworthy witnesses than that of the holy angels. They're not going to lie. So here are two witnesses. But Mary didn't have to wait long before she became the third witnesses, before she had confirmed to her what it is they had said. After she had spoken with the angels, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there. Though she couldn't tell at first that it was Him, probably because she was crying and her vision was blurred from her tears. But Jesus asked her, why are you weeping? 
and who, who it was that she was seeking. Now, she thought it might have been the gardener and that maybe the gardener had taken away his body. And so she asked him in verse 15, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him and I will take him away. Apparently, those first two witnesses weren't, weren't quite enough. And when she had said this, we read in verse 16, Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabboni, which means teacher. And then she really just reached out and took hold of him with a grip that Jesus, from his expression, uh, looked like she wasn't going to let go. She was holding on to him uh, tightly. Now, think about this for a minute. I mean, what would that be like to be Mary and to see Jesus in this way? Well, I think the only way we can conceive of it is... Um, if we too were to lose somebody, let's say that we loved, somebody that we loved more than anyone else in the world, we lost that person, they were dead as far as we were concerned, we weren't going to see them again for a very long time. You see, if they were a believer, they're with the Lord, but you know how it is, you miss those whom you love. But you weren't expecting to see that person again, at least in this life, and suddenly to see them standing before you alive again, what would you do? Well, you'd probably do what Mary did. You'd probably just reach out and grab that person and, and hold on to them in a way that you never want to let go of them again, to hold on to them forever. Now, I do believe that what Jesus says here, he's not meaning to be cruel. Jesus never is cruel. Jesus is always perfectly loving. But he said, Mary, you need to let go of me. <laughs> I have yet to ascend. Now, he didn't mean by that I have to go up and down and then I'm going to go you know, visit the disciples. He was talking about the 40 days from then he was going to ascend. But Mary, you can't keep holding on to me like this because there's still some things that I have to do. One day, you are going to be with me. One day, you will be able to hold on to me and cling to me forever. But today is, is not that day. Now is not the time. Rather, what I want you to do is I want you to go and tell my disciples that I'm alive and that I am going to ascend. And that's exactly what she did. We read in verse 18, Mary Magdalene came announcing to the disciples, I have seen the Lord, and that he had said these things to her. Now also I want you to notice what Jesus said in verse 17, what he tells Mary to tell the disciples. I ascend to my Father and your Father, and my God and your God. Now that His work was complete, their relationship with the Father was secure. Because His work is complete, our relationship with the Father is secure as well. He is not just the Father, but He is our Father. And He is not just, you know, uh, Jesus God. He is our God as well, if we are trusting Him this morning. Now, I want you to notice something else here that's interesting, and that is why was Mary the one who was given the privilege of being the first one to see the risen Lord? Why was she the one? Well, I think there's a few answers to that question. Who was the first one to the tomb? It was Mary. There were others with her as well, so we do need to make a distinction there. She remained at the tomb while the others went away, while the others went away to do whatever they went. They went back to their homes and so forth, but she stayed there thinking about what, what had happened. This was Mary Magdalene, remember? This is not Mary, the mother of Jesus, the one who was so venerated, you know, by the, the Roman church. This is Mary Magdalene, the one who was the harlot, the one who had, had seven spirits or demons cast out of her. She was the one who waited. She was the one who was weeping. She was the one who cared, you see. Not that the others didn't care, but let's just say she cared perhaps a bit more. She was the one who had been forgiven much, and so she was the one who was thankful much. Remember how Jesus said to Simon the Pharisee when he was rebuking Jesus for this, letting this woman weep and wipe you know, his, his feet, uh, wash his, his feet with her tears and wipe them with her hair? He said if he knew what kind of woman this was, he wouldn't even let her touch him. And then Jesus 
asked Simon that question. You know, there were two people who had this debt, and one was greater, one was less, and the Lord forgave them both. Which one will love him more? Well, Simon says the one whose debt was greater, and Jesus says, you're right. This woman had a greater debt, and it's forgiven, and she loves more, and you think you don't even need forgiveness, and so you don't love me at all. Well, you see, Mary Magdalene knew about the grace of God, and she knew about His love, and because she'd experienced that love, she loved Him, and she wanted to minister to Him, and she wanted to serve Him, and that's why she was there. And loving the Lord as much as she did, she was the one who was honored to see Him the first. Our love to the Lord can be measured by our devotion to Him, by how much we are committed to to Him, and that is shown by the way we live, the kind of life we live, whether we're actually doing what Jesus said. Remember what Jesus said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. That's how you show me your love. It's not by thinking warm thoughts, feeling warm thoughts, thinking lofty thoughts, saying lofty words, although it's a part of it. It's by doing what He says. That's how we show Him love. That's how He wants us to show Him, and that's what we know that that love is real. And it goes beyond just well-wishing. It actually does it. Even as James says, the same thing is true with regard to how we treat other people. You say you love your, your brother, your sister, and you see them in need, and you say be warm and be filled. He says, what good is that? Wishing them well and not really giving them what they need. You see, there has to be the action behind it. Well, here are the actions. She was demonstrating her love to the Lord, and that is how we demonstrate our love to Him. That's what He wants to see in us, is that we actually are serving Him. We actually are obeying Him. And the reward of that love, which is a purely a reward of grace, is to experience His love more. We saw that a little bit earlier on in John, where the more we give ourselves to the Lord, the more we experience that love that He has for us, the more He reveals it to us. Well, here we see Jesus revealing that love to Mary. Now, Jesus also appeared to ten of His disciples later that day. Judas, by this time, of course, was dead. He had committed suicide after betraying Jesus to the Jewish leaders and then seeing that He had been condemned to death. He felt remorse, gave the money back, went out and hung Himself, so He's gone. And Thomas was absent, but the rest of the disciples were there. They were hiding. They were afraid of the Jews, and that's because they, they didn't understand that Jesus was to raise, you know, be raised from the dead. They were despairing. But while the doors were shut, Jesus suddenly appears to them to minister to them, to minister peace to them. Verses 19 and 20. Peace be with you. And when he had said this, he showed them both his hands and his side. The disciples then rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus says, Peace, as it were, he, to comfort them in their fears. And then he shows them, This is me. Look. Here are the, the nail wounds from the crucifixion. Look at my side. This is where the spear went through and pierced my heart. He was proving to them that he was, in fact, the one that had been dead and now was alive again. And, of course, when they saw that, they believed and they rejoiced. They rejoiced because the one they loved was alive. They weren't quite like Mary. You know, men respond a little bit differently than men do and... <laughs> they didn't just ah, you know, give me that, let go of me, guys. I haven't yet ascended. No, they didn't, they didn't do that in this case, but they still rejoiced to see the one whom they love, and they also rejoiced because seeing Jesus alive meant their sins were forgiven. They, were, they knew that they were sure of heaven. This one was alive. That means that they would also live once they died. This one had conquered death for them. And so they rejoiced, as we also should rejoice that Jesus has conquered death for us. Now, when the disciples later saw Thomas, who was absent, and they told him what had happened, he immediately believed, right? No, no, he didn't believe. He says in verse 25, unless I see in his hands the imprint of the nails and put my finger into the place of the nails and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. Now, I think for that particular statement, Thomas had to wait another week before he actually got to see Jesus. But eight days later, 
which, by the way, by Jewish reckoning, would again be the first day of the week. The disciples were together again, and this time Thomas was with them. Jesus came again and gave them his greeting of peace. And then in verse 27, then he said to Thomas, reach here with your finger and see my hands, and reach here your hand and put it into my side, and do not be unbelieving, but believing. Now, I want you to, to think about three things from, from this particular encounter. First of all, Jesus appeared, notice, on the first day of the week in the morning, the first day of the week on the evening, and the first day of the week, a week later, to Thomas. Jesus was setting apart the day of His resurrection by His appearances to be His particular day. By the way, that's what we believe John was referring to in the book of Revelation when he said, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. Well, what was the Lord's day? Well, He wasn't talking about the future day of His judgment, but on the day that Jesus rose from the dead. He was in the Spirit on this day, the first day of the week. Uh, again, Jesus was setting this day apart to be His day and the day that His people would come together to love Him and to worship Him according to the fourth commandment. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. The new covenant Sabbath is based upon the finished work of our Lord Jesus Christ and not upon the work of the old creation. The old creation was destroyed by sin, but Jesus has made all things new through His work. So there's a new creation and the day we are then to observe and remember that is the Lord's day, the day when He rose again from the dead, the day when His work was complete. Now, secondly, Jesus knew what Thomas had said, even though Thomas wasn't, or I should say Jesus wasn't there physically when Thomas actually said it. Jesus knows what we're thinking. Jesus knows what we're saying. We need to be careful what we think. <laughs> we need to be careful what we say. We need to make sure that we don't just do it because, you know, Jesus is watching and we shouldn't have to do it just for that reason, but because we love Him and we want to do what He tells us to do, whether He's watching us or not, but He knows regardless. And then thirdly, Jesus was concerned for Thomas. He was concerned that Thomas believe, and so he actually met the qualifications that Thomas had said, I'm not going to believe unless I see it for myself. And so he appeared again to prove to Thomas that he had risen. And Thomas, when he saw him, believed. And he answered him in verse 28, my Lord and my God. Now, he not only believed that Jesus was alive, but he also believed what Paul told us was, again, one of the effects of the resurrection. It was to prove that he is the Son of God. He was declared to be the Son of God with power by the resurrection. And so he believed that he was his Lord, and he believed that he was God, the Son of God in our nature. And then Jesus says to him in verse 29, Because you have seen me, have you believed? Blessed are they who did not see and yet believed. At the very beginning of Jesus' ministry, he commended Nathanael. Remember, Nathanael was one of those who actually followed Jesus, became one of his disciples. But he commended Nathanael because Nathanael believed that Jesus was the Messiah purely on the basis of one thing Jesus said. Before Philip called you, I saw you under the fig tree. Rabbi, you were the, the, the king of Israel. You were the son of God. Jesus says, you believe because I told you I saw you under the fig tree? You're going to see greater things than this. Well, Thomas had seen all of those greater things, and somehow he still didn't believe and wouldn't believe until he saw it for himself. By the way, we've got to be careful about being too harsh with Thomas because the other disciples didn't believe either until they saw him. But Jesus says, blessed are they who did not see and yet believed. Now, have you seen him? Have I seen him? Have we seen him in the way that Thomas saw him or the disciples saw him or Mary? No, we haven't. But we have received him. And we have done it in the way that Jesus has told us that those who, who do it this way are blessed. We can't see him anymore physically because he's in heaven. We have to depend on eyewitness 
testimony to this fact, the testimony that the Lord has given us. As a matter of fact, what we've just read here in John chapter 20 is one of the testimonies that we have. But through these testimonies, we have seen Him. And because we have seen Him and we have believed, Jesus says we are blessed. We are blessed because He has given us His Holy Spirit to open our eyes and to believe these things even though we haven't seen them. And we are blessed because having done so, our sins are forgiven. And we are safe now from hell, from where we would be forever without Jesus. Let me just encourage you this morning that if you haven't trusted Jesus, if you haven't believed on Him, ask Him now to reveal Himself to you by His Holy Spirit. You have to see Him through the eyes of faith. You have to believe on Him if you are to be saved. If you do not, you will perish. Now, my third and fourth points are briefer than these first two points. But thirdly, we see the commission to share this good news of the resurrection with others. We've seen how important the resurrection is. We saw that at the very beginning. And so why the Lord made sure there were so many people who saw Him alive. And by the way, we did read one other uh, account, and that was in the 1 Corinthians 15. It wasn't just the disciples that saw Him or the apostles, but there was over 500 that saw Him at one time. Uh, there were many eyewitnesses. It was important that there be eyewitnesses to the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ, that those things be written down and preserved for us. But you see, equally important to the Lord is that this message of the resurrection be shared with others. And so we read in verse 21, so Jesus said to them again, and by the way, this was the first appearing, but it, all, it still applies to Thomas and it applies to us as well. Peace be with you, as the Father has sent me, I also send you. As the Father sent me into the world to do a particular work, so I am sending you into the world to do a particular work. Now here is an earlier giving of the Great Commission. We might say a prelude to the final version that Jesus will give to His disciples just before he, he ascends to take this message that He died, but He overcame death, and that all who trust in Him will overcome death in Him. They were to take this message, what we call the gospel, to the world. Now, as you know... This is what He wants us to do. This commission that was given to the disciples here, that was given to them just before He ascends is a commission. It was not given just to them, but it was given to the church as a whole. The Lord wants us to point others to Him. To point, not, we, we can't really bear testimony with regard to, I saw Him, because I haven't seen Him, you haven't seen Him, at least in that way, but we can draw their attention to those who did see Him. And we can also tell them what we have seen. We have seen the Lord through faith. We know that this testimony is true. Now, that's not something you and I can show them, but it's something that the Lord can show them, and it's something that He will show them if He is pleased to do so, but we have to point them to the gospel first. We have to share the gospel with them. That's why Paul says, I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes. We shouldn't be ashamed of it. It is our hope of eternal life. It's what saves us from hell. It's what will save everybody else from hell who trusts in Him. So we should share it because that is how God will open the eyes and reveal the resurrected Jesus Christ to them as well. And then finally, we see the power to proclaim the resurrection. I mean, does the Lord basically tell us, go do this on your own strength? We don't have much strength. We don't have much resource, but He does. And so He gives it to us so that we'll be able to do this. We read in verse, in verse 22, and when He had said this, He breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. Now, we don't know exactly what Jesus was doing here because we know Pentecost was still 50 days away. Actually, yeah, this was the first appearance on the first day of the week, so 50 days later. Was this a partial giving of the Spirit, basically just sort of temporary until the day of Pentecost comes? Was this a promise? You know, Jesus earlier said to Mary, stop clinging to me, I haven't yet ascended. Tell my disciples that I am ascending 
but yet that was still 50 days away. So was he talking about Pentecost? I, I think perhaps he was. But we do know, regardless, that this is the source of power, what we need to be able to do what the Lord has called us to do. The Lord has made every provision for us. He has given us the strength and the power we need to carry out His commission through His Holy Spirit, which we saw, of course, in the Upper Room Discourse. Jesus said, I'm going to leave, but I'm going to send another comforter. And when He comes, He's going to do all that you need. He's going to do for you what I did for you. And He is going to be in you. He's going to be with you forever. And He's going to give you the power to do what I've called you to do. So, realizing that Jesus has made this provision, we need to pray and ask the Lord for this help to give to us this power and to give this power to all of us here and to all of His people, wherever they may be, that we may effectively bring His gospel to others. And by effective, I mean not just by being able to share, a, a, you know, say, a coherent message, to be able to tell them or describe for them what actually happened, but to do it from a kind of life that is believable. You know, we have to live Christ to share Christ. And actually, sometimes we really can't even live Christ until we actually try to share Christ. One of the, I'm convinced that one of the biggest bottlenecks to the Lord's power in our lives is the fact that we don't take that step and share the gospel with other people. When we, do, when we don't do that, it grieves what we have of the Holy Spirit within us, and it makes us weaker. But if we were to step out and do it in faith, and by faith, I mean, we don't really see the resources, we really don't see the power, we don't really have the confidence that we're going to be able to do it very well because we're just looking to ourselves, but when we actually step out and do it, I think that's when the Lord gives to us the biggest infusion of power to be able to do it. So if we wait until we have the power, we'll probably never do it and we'll grow weaker. But if we take what we have and step out in faith, I believe the Lord will give us a greater grace and we will be able to bear witness with even greater power. Now Jesus goes on lastly to tell His disciples something that sounds rather strange, but I believe means this, that they would be able to tell whoever receives Him that their sins are forgiven but whoever rejects him, that their sins are not forgiven. And I believe that's what it means here when he says in verse 23, if you forgive the sins of any, their sins have been forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they have been retained. You know, the Roman church takes this and basically says the priest has the ability to absolve or not absolve people of their sins. No man has the authority to forgive sins. Only God can do that. Now, Jesus did it because he's God. But we can't do that. All we can do is make a declaration based upon the evidence. And I believe that what Jesus was speaking of here is the same thing that he was talking about in Mark 16, verse 16, when he says this, and this is during the Great Commission as well, he who has believed and has been baptized shall be saved, but he who has disbelieved shall be condemned. Somebody believes, their sins will be forgiven. If they don't believe, they won't be forgiven. And you can tell them that. You know, if you believe on the basis of that faith, if you've trusted Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. But if you don't believe, your sins still cling to you and you will still have to answer for them. Well, Jesus is just simply telling us what's going to happen and what we can say on the basis of their acceptance or the rejection of the gospel. So as we go out to share the gospel with others, we need to understand that we can do basically the same thing based upon whether they accept the gospel or reject the gospel. But do be careful because uh, acceptance of the gospel is not just believing facts. I think we know that by now. There has to be the fruit of a change of life. So I think the if has to be there. If you have truly trusted Jesus, if you are repenting of your sins, if you are following Jesus Christ, if you are laying down your life and doing what He calls you to do, your sins are forgiven, and you are going to be with the Lord in heaven. But if you haven't done that, your sins are not forgiven. We can say that with absolute certainty because that is what the Lord says. So as we now prepare to come to the table to remember the death 
of our Lord, which is what the table is for. And as we think about the Lord's resurrection on this day, which is the day of His resurrection, may the Lord again assure us that if we have believed, if we have repented, if we are following Him, our sins are forgiven. May He assure us of that. And may He also, by His grace, give to us more of His Spirit, more of His power, that we might be the witnesses of His resurrection to others, that we may share the gospel with others. And by the way, let me just mention this again, that this is the prerequisite to coming to the table. We have to remember we, that we must be trusting in the Lord. We must believe. We must turn from our sins. We must be following Him. We have to repent of all of our sins before we come to the table. And we also have to come with the expectancy that Jesus is going to meet us here. Remember what Paul tells us? The table is a communion with the body and blood of our Lord, not with, you know, again, it's not a physical eating as some, again, Roman church and, and the Lutheran church believe in some way we are actually eating the body and, and drinking the blood of Christ. We don't believe that because when Jesus actually served the table for the first time, His body was intact, hadn't been broken yet, His blood hadn't been shed yet, but he still what it was. We do believe it's symbolic, and we do believe the communion is with the spiritual benefits that Jesus has actually earned for us through the work that He did on earth, through His death, through His resurrection, that there is a communion going on, that Jesus is actually present here spiritually to bless. And we need to know that blessing is here. We need to look for that blessing. We need to receive it by faith as we receive these elements from Jesus Christ, and that blessing, that blessing is the Holy Spirit, more of His Holy Spirit, more of His power, more of His strength, that we might be better witnesses of uh, the resurrection. So let's take a few moments and let's bow silently in prayer and let's ask the Lord to prepare us to, to come to the table where we might eat and drink to our growth in grace.